Good morning. I'm going to be reading our text for today, which is Acts 2, 1 through 13. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said, they are filled with new wine. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. Uh, as you can see, we've got a lot to cover today in terms of our text, and so I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on the intro, but I do want to catch you up just a little bit with where we are in Acts thus, thus far. And so last week we saw that Luke is writing this work to kind of pick up where uh, the story, the gospel of Luke left off, to tell um, the story of what happened where God, through the power of the Spirit, began to build and grow his church to be a power in the world. I mean, we sit here today on this Sunday, over a billion believers will gather worldwide in similar settings like this to worship Jesus Christ, to uh, serve the body together, to exercise our gifts and to give and to do all the things that the church does. And it all began with this small movement in Acts. And so Jesus, he actually told his uh, 11 apostles who had been with him for three years, he says, hey guys, don't, don't like try to go out and, and win the world for Christ. Don't try to do all the things that you've even done before, but I want you to wait in Jerusalem, spend some time there, and when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to receive power and you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, even to the very ends of the earth. And they did exactly what Jesus says. They, they met with him on the mountaintop. They returned to Jerusalem. And it says that during this time, they were devoting themselves to prayer. And so there was about 120 gathered there. There were uh, the 11 apostles. Uh, they actually added a 12th uh, here. And then the women and the other people who were kind of around them, followers of Jesus, they were praying fervently. And then it happened that the day of Pentecost came. Now, Pentecost is 50 days from the Passover. It's kind of the conclusion of the, the harvest, if you will. It's kind of celebrating the bringing in of the harvest. And so what would have happened in Jerusalem on this day, some estimate as many as 200,000 Jews from uh, basically the whole Mediterranean world, they would have come to Jerusalem to celebrate this great feast. So the disciples, they're, they're praying, they're gathered together in this room <clears throat> Praying for God to move, praying for the coming of the Spirit, praying that God would utilize them. And then the Spirit comes, and it is a profound event that has forever shaped our world. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me. We're going to begin in chapter 2, beginning in verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. That word together, this emphasis, it's going to be repeated throughout Acts. That that's what the church does. We gather. That's part of, what, that's part of who we are. As a matter of fact, the, the word ekklesia, uh, it, it, if you put kind of two contract words together, you have ek, which means out, and kaleos, uh, which, which means called, if you will. And so the called out ones, the ones who would come together uh, out of their homes or towns or whatever, these people would gather. That's who the church is. If we don't gather, we're not the church, right? And so they're all together in one place when the day of Pentecost had come, and suddenly, I want you to hear this because, th honestly, if this happened this morning, this would turn some things upside down for us, right? Chapter 2, suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind. And so they're, they're in a house. It's likely uh, an upstairs, probably an open air type thing. 120 people gather there. And then this sound invades the place like a violent rushing wind. This wasn't like kind of a little subtle hum. It's not the fan you sleep to at night. It was more like a tornado entering into this building. They hear this sound like a violent rushing wind. And it doesn't stop with that. But it continues on in verse 3. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. 
They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So Jesus says, hey, don't take off to go do the ministry just yet. I want you to wait until the Holy Spirit comes. And when he does, you're going to be my witnesses. Jerusalem and Judea, Samaria, even to the ends of the earth. You guys who all denied me just 50 short days ago. You guys who all abandoned me whenever I, I got arrested. You guys who were fearful, who denied even knowing who I was. You just wait until the Holy Spirit comes. And so here they are, they're praying, this wind sound comes, tongues of fire come to land on each of the people who were there. And, and, and to tell you just how clearly this was the power of God and not the power of men, they began to declare the mighty works of God. But it's not even in the language that they knew. Just so God could make absolutely clear to you and to me and to every disciple who would ever come after him, the work of God is accomplished by the power of the Holy Spirit of God. It is in our intellect. It is in our persuasive abilities. It's not our charisma. They're speaking a language they don't even know, and they're proclaiming the mighty deeds of God. Now, it's likely we don't know exactly where the house was or how it was all set up, but it's likely that one of two things occurred here. Either when they began to speak in these unknown tongues to them, they either spilled out of the house, probably in the outer courts of the temple, or um, they were in this elevated open-air room, and people down below could hear. Remember, 200,000 Jews from all over the known world were gathered in Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. And so as they began to speak in these other languages, this roar comes, this violent wind, they see the tongues of fire, people start to pay attention. I just want you to hear this. For the Jewish people, they were raised in Judaism, and they knew the Old Testament. They could quote the verses. They had practiced the, the law and the sacrifices. They would have done all the things that had been prescribed to them, but nothing like this had ever occurred in their lifetime. As a matter of fact, the Jews during this time, there was a little bit of a drought, if you will, of prophecy. Not even the prophets were speaking. As a matter of fact, no prophet had spoken for 400 years. And then they're in Jerusalem on this day. They would observe the feast just like they always did, doing their faithful duty. And they hear this sound, and they see what looks like tongues of fire come to rest on these people. And they see that they, they begin to speak in tongues that are unknown. And so in verse 5 it says, Now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under, un, under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together, and they were bewildered. Because each, of, each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, Why, are, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? Now, Galileans um, <clears throat> were kind of like people from eastern Oklahoma, right? Uh, they spoke Aramaic, but if they would have traveled around and, and to other Aramaic-speaking places, the people would have said to them, you're not from around here, are you? They had their own dialect. As a matter of fact, when Peter was outside the house of the high priest where Jesus was being questioned and beaten, uh, one of the people recognized that he must be a follower of Jesus because she heard it in the sound of his voice. She's like, I get it. It's by the way you talk. You can look it up. Matthew uh, chapter 26, I believe you can read about it. So this girl's like, Peter, you sound like one of those guys with, with Jesus. You're a Galilean. Now, Galileans were not profoundly educated people. As a matter of fact, they were kind of looked down upon. And so when these Galileans begin to speak in unknown tongues, there is bewilderment. They're bewilderment. They're amazed. They're shocked at what they're hearing. I mean, they've just seen something that can only be described as miraculous. They're trying to figure out what is this thing that is happening in our midst in the same way that you and I would be, Right? I mean, they're in awe. The Jews had spent their entire lives believing, listen, we are the people of God. Abraham is my father. They could trace their lineage. They knew the law. They knew the prophets. I am good with God. Devin asked the, the question to her young lady. If they would have answered, hey, uh, do you know for sure that you would you know, spend your eternity in heaven? They would have been like, absolutely. Man, I'm one of God's people. Abraham is my father. Here's the tribe I was born into. To answer that question, they would have been like, ah, yes, I got this. The trouble is that they were wrong. And the events of this day, this powerful movement of the Spirit that was coming with this uh, terribly loud sound, tongues of fire, people speaking in unknown languages, 
it kind of turned what they'd always believed upside down. It made, made them realize that there was something greater going on in their midst than they had ever realized, that God was up to something that maybe he hadn't done before. When the sound occurred, the crowd came together and they were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished. Are not all these who are speaking God lands? And in verse 8, and how is it that we each hear them in our own language to which we were born? When we get the list, there were Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontius, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the districts of Libya and Cyrene, and visitors from Rome and Jews and proselytes and Cretans and Arabs. We hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And before this moment, they would have said, man, I, I'm going to spend eternity in heaven with God. Man, I, I, I've kept the law. I've offered the sacrifices. Man, I, I know the Shema. I've, I, I've, even, I've like got it written on my doorpost. I've kept feasts and festivals. I obey the Sabbath. I tithe. I do all the right things. And then this really profound event happens in their life, and suddenly it turns their world upside down a little bit. They're bewildered. They're amazed, and they're astonished, and they're trying to make sense of what they have just seen because they've known how God has worked out their entire lifetimes they would known how, who God has been. They knew the Old Testament. They'd never seen anything quite like this. In verse 12, And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity. And they were saying to one another, What does this mean? What do we make of what we just saw? I mean, I've, I've known who God is. I know the law and the prophets. I can quote the scriptures. But what do we make to make of what we've just seen? And they did what many of us would do. They tried to come up with a naturalistic explanation for the events they'd just seen. In verse 13, others were mocking and saying they're full of sweet wine. Well, they must be drunk. Because we all know that when you get drunk, you hear loud sounds and tongues of fire come to land on people and they speak in languages they don't know, right? That was just the best that they could come up with. Their hearts were hard. And so Peter, who just... 50 days before. I swear I don't know that man. In verse 14, it says he took his stand with the 11. And he raised his voice and declared to them, in the power of the Holy Spirit, by the way. This wasn't Peter. This was something more profound in his life. He said, men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words. He's like, I'm not backing away from this. I need to tell you exactly what's happening. He's like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to explain to you what's just happened here in your midst. I want you to let you know what's really going on in these circumstances. He says, these men aren't drunk as you suppose. It's only the third hour of the day. He's like, it's 9 o'clock in the morning. And every good Jew knew that on the day of the feast, you would start off by fasting. And the fast didn't end until 10 a.m. He's like, they're not drunk. They haven't had anything to eat even today. But something more significant has happened here. And then he begins to relay to them what God has done, who God is, how he's begun to work in their midst. And he starts with the prophet Joel. And he says these words. He says that this was what was spoken of through the prophet Joel. This was foretold long ago. You have heard this your entire lives. How could you continue to hear this but not understand what's just happened in your midst? Quoting Joel, he says, It shall be in the last days, God says, that I will pour forth of my spirit on all mankind. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men dream dreams. Even on my bond slaves, both men and women, I will in those days pour forth of my spirit and they shall prophesy. And I will grant wonders in the sky above and signs on the earth below. Blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Before the great and glorious day of the Lord shall come. And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, shall be saved. He's like, you want to know what just happened here? The thing that you've looked forward to for your entire life, the thing that your parents long to see, their grandparents long to see, the thing that the prophets have been talking about, the thing that David had been talking about, the thing that literally the nation of Israel has been looking forward to since its inception, it happened right here in your midst that you've been busy going about your religion and quoting your verses and doing all the right duties and things, but you've missed out on the Savior, that there is something more than keeping the law and doing the right things and avoiding the wrong things and observing the right days and avoiding the wrong ones. 
But you have missed the power of God, have missed in your life that will transform your heart and save your soul. He concludes this prophecy, which God said years and years and years, hundreds of years before this moment, that everyone who calls in the name of the Lord will be saved. Can I just ask you to put yourself in this position for a minute? You were raised just like you were raised. Maybe you were raised in church and you know how all this works. Maybe you know the rest of the story because you've been around for a long time. Maybe you're brand new to this, but I want you to just put yourself in their shoes for a minute. And you hear the sound. You're in the room. The violent rushing wind. You see tongues of fire come to rest on people. You hear them begin declaring the mighty deeds of God, and you hear it in your own language. How would you explain that? What would you do? You might as they did. But yeah, they must be drunk. That's what's got to be going on here. Or you might realize that God was certainly at work in your midst, that there wasn't some natural explanation for these supernatural events, but rather that maybe God was trying to get your attention through the big outward signs, the things that were, I mean, not possible to be made up by men. Maybe God was trying to get your attention. So Peter begins to declare to them, Hey, this is the fulfillment of the prophecy. And this is what God's been doing since the very beginning. In the last days, he's going to send his Holy Spirit. That We don't have to live ordinary lives where we continue to chase after the same empty and broken things of this world. I mean, we could be filled with the Spirit and walk in this abundance of life. Your young men will dream dreams. The old men are going to see visions. It's this powerful work, and it's not about who you are, whether you're a Pharisee or a Sadducee or one of those, but instead... Man, whoever's going to call on the name of the Lord, they're going to be saved. And he continues to tell them about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in the midst of hearing this, these men who would have answered the question, hey, I'll be in heaven with God one day. They knew it. They were, they were confident that, I mean, they'd gone through all the right steps. They had the right birth. They were from a Christian home. They had all the right answers. Uh, they come to recognize in the midst of Peter's preaching that maybe everything they had believed wasn't going to be enough. That maybe, although they thought they were right with God, they'd never come to experience this salvation that Peter was talking about. Matter of fact, he goes on and tells them basically, hey, you the Jews, you crucified the Messiah. You crucified the one that God sent to save the entire world. You were so caught up in all of your religious activity that you missed the Savior of the world. But that was God's plan all along. He declares the gospel to them. Peter speaking up boldly to the people. And realizing for the first time that they weren't nearly as right with God as they thought they might have been that maybe they weren't nearly as close to God as they otherwise thought they were. The scriptures tell us that they were pierced to the heart. This is uh, Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they heard the good news of Jesus Christ and what he had done for them, that they were absolutely sinners who were in desperate need of a Savior. I mean, think about this. If you crucified the Son of God you're probably not in too tight with God, right? It really doesn't matter if you've observed the Sabbath and kept the law and all of that. Uh, you crucify the Son of God, things are not going well, uh, right? It's not, it's not looking good for you. And they realize in this moment that they're sinners and that they're in need of a Savior. In verse 37, it says, Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, What should we do? What does a person do that is hopelessly sinning against God. What, are you going to offer a sacrifice for that? Are you going to give some money? What do you do when your sin has resulted in the death of God's Son? And Peter says to him in verse 38, he says, Repent, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you, and your children, and all who are far off, and as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. Peter tells these people who have come to this recognition that they're sinners, that they've sinned against God in a rather remarkable way. 
He tells them that there's still hope for them. Matter of fact, that Jesus and his death on the cross was actually making the way that they could be reunited with God, that they could ultimately be saved and spend eternity forever with God in heaven. What must we do? He gives them just two, two instructions. The first thing he tells them to do is to repent. Now, repentance, it's, it's been defined in, in various ways, but biblical repentance, some people would say it's just a, to change your mind. Uh, but repentance, it does indeed involve a change. It's a shift in your thinking. And for these people who have trusted in their Judaism, they would have marked down like church attendance, like Sunday school teacher. I won the Bible quiz. I know the verses. They would have looked at their life like I helped the poor. I've done a lot of really good things. These people who would have judged their lives by their morality according to the law, keeping of the law, um, it was kind of turned upside down in this minute rather than viewing themselves as pretty good moral people on the basis of how well they've kept the law, they suddenly see themselves as overwhelming sinners who are in need of a Savior. And so, Peter says, you need to repent. Which means you acknowledge that you are indeed a sinner and that you turn away from the path that you've been walking, the sinful things that you've been living in. You turn away from the things you've been trusting in and instead you turn to Jesus Christ and you turn to him in faith. Faith in his work instead of your own. Where you stop trusting in your own morality, your own goodness, your own ability to work your way to heaven. And instead, you trust in that sacrifice that Jesus Christ offered for you on the cross. Peter says, hey, here's what you should do. You should repent of your sins. And then he goes on to tell them at the end of the verse here. He says, and each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the Holy Spirit. Now, this was no small thing. This is not, hey, uh, pray a prayer and walk an aisle kind of getting saved. For the Jews, this would have been scandalous. For the Jews who have just kind of very publicly crucified Jesus Christ, this would have been the talk of the known world at the time that Jesus, this man who performed the miracles who made the lame to walk and the blind to see this man had been crucified on a Roman cross, and it's all supposed to be over. And it was done by the Jewish, the, the chief priests, by the leaders of the Jewish people. Peter's like, you turn away from the things you've been trusting in, and you begin to trust in the name of Jesus Christ. You begin to live your life uh, not according to Judaism anymore, but according to the leadership of Jesus Christ. You be baptized in his name. You take his yoke upon you. You become his disciple. He becomes your master. In just a few chapters, we're going to see that this was not a popular thing to do. The Apostle Paul, who at the time was known as Saul, for people who would take on the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ, who would be followers, they called it followers of the way, become Christians, if you will. He would go and get letters from the leaders and have these men and women thrown in prison. He would give approval unto these apostate Jews who had turned away from Judaism and trusted in Jesus. He would give approval unto them being stoned to death. For these Jews who had seen this remarkable thing, this remarkable opportunity, honestly, it was this disruption in their lives. Who would have thought, but when they came to this day, man, I'm so good with God. They came to recognize that they were sinners. And he says, hey, you turn away from your sin, you turn to Jesus Christ, and then you be baptized. You take on the banner of the Lord Jesus Christ in your life. It was a costly decision. And yet Jesus tells us the kingdom of God like a man who was out working in the field, he's digging around, and he finds a buried treasure there. And he recognizes how precious that treasure is. So he covers it up and he goes home and he sells everything he has. And he goes and he buys that field because he knows that what he's found there is worth more than anything else he had. We sit here 2,000 years after the death of Jesus Christ, after Pentecost, after the birth of the church. And yet, many of us sit here in a similar scenario. Many of us, if, if you walked in here today and I ask you the question, hey, are you good with Jesus Christ? Are you confident that you'd spend your eternity in heaven with Jesus if you were to die today? Many of you would say, yeah. And the answer you would give me is a whole lot like what the Jews would have given. Well, yeah, I've kept the law. I'm a pretty good moral person. I've, uh, you know, I've helped some people who are in need. I give to the church. My question for you Has there ever been a time in your life 
where God convicted you that you were indeed a sinner who was in desperate need of a Savior, where you repented of trusting in yourself, you repented of trusting in your, your, your old worldly ways and going your own, and you instead, instead said, no, no, I'm going to turn and I'm going to follow after Jesus. And I'm going to be publicly baptized. I'm going to make a declarative statement that I'm dying to the old person I once was, and I'm going to be raised up to walk a new life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Have you experienced the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in your life? Acts is a story of the beginning of the church and the power of the Spirit. And if our church is going to continue, the church of Jesus Christ in this world today, we are going to continue in the power of the Holy Spirit, declaring the mighty deeds of God. But you know this practice that we have to go back to over and over and over? Even for those of us who are in the faith, we look back at our lives, reminded of our sins, the areas that we might have gotten off path, and we repent once again. We turn away from those things. We turn back to Jesus Christ, and we begin to follow him once again. If you're here today, you've been around church, and gone through the motions, you could finish the stories. But there's never been a time where you very publicly repented of your sin and turned to begin to follow Jesus Christ, followed him in baptism, Receive the Holy Spirit and begin to live the life that Jesus Christ has promised you. Uh, in just a second, we're going to have an invitation. And I'm going to invite you to go all in with Jesus Christ. I'm going to invite you to forsake everything else you've known in your life and to follow Jesus with your whole heart. That you might experience new life in him, no longer chasing after the things you've been chasing after. But instead, living your life in the power of the Holy Spirit, declaring the mighty deeds of God. Would you bow with me? Oh, Father, uh, we look to your word. God, we're just humbled. We're humbled at our complete inability to save ourselves. God, to do any of your work here on our own. And so we just pray in these next few moments that your spirit might do the work that he's been doing for 2,000 years. Oh, God, would you help us to see our sin and our desperate need for you. God, would you help us to, to come in this process of repentance. Your, your scriptures tell us it's a gift in response to your kindness. Oh, God, may we turn from our sin, from the things we've been trusting in. May we turn to you. Lord Jesus, may you empower us by the work of your spirit to live our lives out as witnesses here for you. God, for those who don't know you who need to be saved today, I pray that today would be the day of salvation. That they wouldn't wait another minute, minute trusting in themselves or their own goodness and their own morality, but instead they would trust in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.